Hello and welcome to a fresh new edition of Money, Money, Money. I'm Sumera Apti. Today we discuss an important topic which affects all of us, rising interest rates and how to uh, you know, invest in such a scenario. And if you thought that the impact was limited to just your fixed income investments, think again. Even your equity investments are impacted when the prevailing rates in the economy are on the rise, not to mention the added global impact as well. So let me invite Keetan Cha, founder and CEO at Credence Wealth Advisors, to explain the situation as well as the impact on investors and, you know, what to do about it naturally. Keetan, thanks very much for joining in. Let's begin by setting the context first. Why are rates going up globally, not just in India? Hi, Sumaira. Thank you so much for having me on the show. So, Sumaira, what happens is typically when you see any crisis that affects us, let's say 2000, 2008, 2013, 14, any of these periods or uh, periods outside of this as well, whenever there is a crisis which actually ends up impacting the economy, you would typically see that the, the government uh, slash the RBI central bank will have to take some steps and measures to make sure that uh, the impact of that uh, crisis on the real economy is uh, slightly less. And uh, you would generally see that, uh, you know, central banks in such a situation where there is a crisis and an impact on the economy will try and follow a loose monetary policy. Now, what do I mean when I say loose monetary policy? The typical steps that are taken whenever you will see a crisis hit a country, right? You will see uh, interest rates being reduced and you will see a lot of liquidity is infused in the system. When I say interest rates are reduced, in the Indian context, I'm saying, let's say, repo reverse repo rates will be reduced. And when I say liquidity is going to be infused, I'm typically saying in the Indian context, let's say a CRR or an SLR ratio be reduced so that more liquidity can be pumped in the system. Or the other way around, uh, uh, RBI will do something called as open market operations, where RBI will try and buy bonds from the market thereby giving more liquidity to the banks and hence increasing liquidity in the overall market. Now, this is something very similar to what on the global scale we call as quantitative easing, right? So whenever there is a crisis, you would typically see RBI do both of these things or global central banks reduce rates and infuse a lot of liquidity. Now, typically what happens is, Sumera, when there is a lot of uh, liquidity infused in the system, it typically over a period of time leads to inflation. So why does something like this happen? Let me give you a simple example. Now, let's say all other things constant. Let's say there is somebody who wants to buy a laptop, right? Uh, let's say there is only one laptop available to be bought. And then there are a lot of people who want to buy that laptop. So I've created a hypothetical situation where there is a lot of demand for that laptop, but there is only this one laptop. So now we see there is a demand supply gap, right? Now this demand supply gap typically leads to inflation is what normal theory says, right? But imagine a situation that in this demand supply gap situation where there is only one laptop and then there are a lot of people who really want to buy this laptop, nobody's got the money. So, which means if nobody's got the money, typically the price of the laptop won't go up, even if there is a demand supply uh, gap or a situation that arises. For the laptop prices to go up, right? Even when there is a demand supply mismatch, market has to have money. A lot of these people who want to buy the laptops need to have money, only then the price of laptop will go up. So we are invariably saying that inflation typically takes place when demand and supply gap is also accompanied by a lot of liquidity, right? So while the central bank pumps in a lot of liquidity because there is economic crisis, that typically over a period of time leads to inflation, right? So we're currently facing a very similar situation where pandemic hit us, interest rates were lowered, a lot of liquidity was pumped in the system. And now over a period of time, we've started seeing how inflation is coming back to bite us because of so much of liquidity available in the market. Now this time around, the problem also has been Sumera that with so much of liquidity in the market, right? at the same time, the crude prices, because of various reasons, including uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, the crude prices are also pretty elevated because of which the inflation is very sticky at higher levels, right? So uh, a lot of liquidity uh, led to inflation and to control this inflation at this point in time, you know, the RBI or any central banks globally would again have the same option of reducing liquidity in the market, right? Because they cannot do anything with demand and supply as such in the market. And hence, if they really want to target inflation and bring down inflation, 
the only tool available to them or i would say the lowest hanging fruit available to them is to try and reduce liquidity in the market now how how would they try and reduce liquidity in the market again they will do exactly reverse of what they did when there was economic crisis right so they would start increasing interest rates we saw uh, bank of england increase rates we saw us increase rates we even saw india uh, increase repo rates uh, uh, some weeks back right so one tool is increasing rates which were originally reduced when there were crisis and at the same time the another tool that uh, they use is originally they infused a lot of liquidity in the market when there was a crisis now they would want to pull that liquidity uh, out of the market now how do how do they do that exactly the reverse right so they increase the crr ratio so that uh, liquidity is less available in the system and at the same time what they try and do is originally because they wanted to pump a lot of liquidity they were buying bonds from the market now they would do the reverse they will sell a lot of bonds in the market to pump that liquidity out of the system now you see this exactly what us is doing us for one quarter is expected to uh, kind of uh, sell bonds in the market worth uh, 47 billion dollars and from the next quarter on they are going to increase that to 90 billion so uh, in a nutshell what we are trying to say is whenever there is a crisis you will typically see a lot of liquidity fueled in the system interest rates lower and whenever that happens over a period of time because of that it leads to inflation and then to control inflation you do the reverse is where you increase rates and suck liquidity out of the system so this is a cycle that keeps continuing madam understood uh, so keertan uh, you know generally how do assets perform in this environment of rising rates i mean say equity for instance what is a general behavior so sumera uh, equity theoretically is uh, slightly negative uh, in the near term in such a situation and let me explain to you why does something like that uh, really happens now look uh, uh, let's talk about the new demand for loans as soon as interest rates starts going up you will see that it starts impacting the new demand for new loans right is because if the loan is going to become expensive not a lot of us are going to go back and start taking newer and newer loans so if interest rate goes up and loan becomes expensive that is going to hit the demand for new loans and hence it is going to hit non discretionary uh, consumption uh, what do i mean let's say if you are not going to end up taking loans uh, the demand for real estate which is largely driven by home loans is going to come to probably a little moderate expectation you would see if interest rate go up you will see the same thing happening in consumption to do with bikes cars or even small things like laptops so from a market standpoint theoretically whenever interest rates you know kind of move up the assumption is that probably it is going to end up hitting consumption on the non discretionary side and because consumption will get hit right the uh, profits for these corporates which are non non uh, discretionary consumption led over 2 3 quarters will will fall and hence you typically see a small uh, tip in the equities in the near term because of rise in interest rates now that's one side of the story where we are talking about new loan creation now what happens to an existing loan now all of us know that most of these loans that corporate take right they are all all on floating there is hardly any fixed uh, uh, rate loans given out right so if interest rate goes up uh, the cost of serving this loan or the emi for the corporate ends up going up right and in most cases the corporate is not able to pass on pass on this increase in cost or increase in emi or interest back to the consumer you look at infrastructure you look at power just because interest rates have gone up and their emi is on an existing loan has gone up in very simple context they don't they don't try and increase the uh, consumption cost of power or your toll cost uh, for an infrastructure project so the delta is not one the transition of increasing cost uh, to the actual product does not really happen in which is why you will see that new loan creation and people who have taken the old loan both get impacted and hence uh, it is theoretically negative for equities in the short term also at the same time sumera it typically also ends up uh, hurting valuations now how are valuations done so you will typically look at cash flows that a company is going to receive over the next one year two year three year and try and discount that at a rate of interest to find the current value of the company now if this interest rate is supposed to go up then automatically the present value of the cash flow that you are trying to receive or calculate is going to come down which implies that if interest rate goes up 
the value of this company will fall. Uh, uh, you call that as the DCF uh, method, right? So that also ends up impacting the valuation that you are giving this particular company pre the interest rate hike versus post the interest rate. And also in very simple layman language, so Mera, I think when interest rate starts going up, the rate on fixed deposits and various other allied fixed income instruments starts going up. And for retail, it becomes easier that if their fixed deposit is now instead of six paying eight, let me park my money there instead of going to the capital markets. Yeah, I yeah. think these are some reasons why you will theoretically see, you know, the impact negatively. Okay. And what about, uh, say, debt investments or even gold for that matter? I mean, what? how would they be impacted? So, Sumera, debt also to a certain extent is going to be negatively impacted is because uh, you will typically see rise in bond yields have a inverse correlation to the bond price. Now, what I mean by that is to simplify that a little. Let's say if you've taken a three-year fixed deposit today and the three-year fixed deposit pays you a 6% interest today, right? What you're going to ideally get is 6% over the tenure of the next three years. But if interest rate starts moving up in the market, right? The same fixed deposit will pay higher to the person who does a new fixed deposit. But to you, it still keeps paying 6%, which is lower than the market rate. So typically what happens is if you invest in a fixed income instrument in a rising interest rate situation, you typically end up holding a fixed income instrument, which is paying lower coupons than the newer uh, increased interest rate coupons available in the market, right? Which is why the value of your fixed income drops in the market. But this is temporary. You call it the mark to market adjustment. If you hold this fixed deposit till maturity, you are still going to receive 6% and all your money back. But temporarily, if you have to sell your fixed deposit today, right, or bonds today, you will get lesser than 100 rupees because the market interest rate is higher versus what you are typically paid today. So uh, for all practical purposes, when interest rate goes up, that is again, temporarily negative for fixed income. If you want to exit today, if you're going to hold it till maturity, the impact on you is probably zero, right? Now, if you talk about gold, uh, Sumera, gold has a very moderate reaction to uh, rise in rates. Now, why do I say that? Because if money is going to come out of equity, like I explained to you, and fixed income probably uh, on the capital side is also not going to do well, that money has to go somewhere. And typically, it ends up hunting for safe haven, where gold is one and dollar is another. So some money goes to gold. But also what happens is because some money goes to dollar, which is also a safe haven, right? Gold, gold because internationally traded in dollar, if dollar goes up, gold suddenly becomes expensive. And because it becomes expensive, the demand falls, right? So yes, uh, some money goes to gold because of which gold should go up. But because it is internationally traded in dollar and dollar also goes up in such a situation, it balances out. So it's more moderately positive for gold uh, in such a situation. Okay, with that, it's time for a quick break. On the other side, we'll talk about what to do uh, with your investment strategy. Stay tuned, Kirtan will be with us. Hi, welcome back. You're watching Money, Money, Money. And with us, we have Keith Tancha, founder and CEO of Credence Wealth Advisors, talking about how to invest in a rising interest rate scenario. So we've spoken a bit about, you know, how this happens, uh, why interest rates are rising and what is the impact on various assets. Now we want to talk about the investment strategy. So Keith, then let's start with those who already have existing portfolios. Do they need to make any changes? So when I very honestly, uh, uh, my advice may look very cliche, but uh, I think anybody who's invested at this point in time should stick to their asset allocation. Uh, you know, it's it, it looks very fancy for all of us wanting to do something when the markets are moving, either sell or keep buying. But ideally, the best portfolios are the ones which are really untouched, right? Now, most of us end up selling uh, most of our investments uh, because of a lot of panic created by falling markets. And uh, while we end up doing that and market starts recovering, we are typically not invested. Uh, and that is where we miss the opportunity of recovery. So my suggestion really would be not to play around with your long term portfolio a lot, unless there is a serious fundamental change in what you are uh, really holding. I think you should stick to your asset allocation and uh, uh, make sure that if there is a change needed in terms of your uh, rebalancing, 
uh, because markets have moved up and down and that might have changed your asset allocation. Use this opportunity to rebalance and go back to your original asset allocation. Don't do a lot of things. Okay. So what about fresh investments then? I mean, say, let's talk about equity uh, for starters. You know, the market itself is volatile. Uh, for those who are looking to deploy fresh money, what do they do? So, Sumera, I think uh, if you historically look at it, uh, you will see that out of the seven large interest rate uh, cycles that have happened in the US where Fed has started increasing rates, six of the seven cycles, we've, uh, we've had positive returns in the markets, right? But that positive return has come with a lot of volatility. So my suggestion is that at this point in time, if you are trying to infuse any new money, do not come with any short-term view of one, two years. You cannot play this market with anything less than a three to five year view, right? And also in my opinion, uh, you know, of course you will look at your portfolio in its entity, but I think uh, typically you will see in such markets which are expensive and hence falling because of rate hike, you will typically see that uh, active strategies or value investing have always done well historically over momentum strategies or probably uh, uh, passive investing. So this is a situation where if you don't have uh, active or you don't have uh, value investing in your portfolio, I think that this is the time for you to add that kind of that kind of flavor to your portfolio. Okay. And finally, what about fixed income and gold? Fresh investments there? So Sumera, uh, let me break the fixed income question into three. So let's say if you have a very clear view of how long do you really want to stay invested in the market, then there are a lot of target maturity funds available uh, out there. So if you know that you want to stay invested for three years, then there are three years target maturity funds, just invest your money in them and forget, right? If you have a short term view, you don't want to stay invested for more than one year, it is temporary parking for you. Uh, I would su suggest that you stay short on the short end of the curve by investing in, uh, you know, ultra short term or money market kind of funds. But if you have long duration or long term uh, horizon of investing in fixed income right now, let's say a three year, five year view, then you should do something called as barbell. Now, barbell is a strategy in which you invest 50% of what you really want to invest at the shorter end of the curve. So let's say a money market or an ultra short term fund kind of a fund. And you invest 50% of it at the higher end of the curve, which is let's say long duration funds. This strategy over three or five year will, in my opinion, uh, prove to be the best strategy in a rising interest rate uh, environment, specific, specifically for fixed income investors. Uh, on gold, uh, uh, I'm not sure if my view will be appreciated, but I would rather not take any uh, excessive bets on gold. Gold, in my opinion, is a very tactical play. And, uh, you know, it is meant for people who really understand when to come in and come out of gold. So if you really understand uh, what moves gold prices and you'll be able to time it well, then uh, you try and take aggressive bets on gold. But uh, largely, in my opinion, for retail investors, uh, gold allocation, they should stick to what their asset allocation strategy is and don't go overboard. Then, then what the asset allocation really requires you to participate on the gold side. And uh, Keetan, uh, you know, just out of curiosity, what about small savings, etc.? I mean, would that figure? Oh, of course. Look, like I said, that if you have a very uh, clear understanding of uh, when do you really want the money, then anything which is target maturity will fit your will fit your requirement, right? You know the maturity of that product. You know the interest, which is uh, predominantly fixed. So if you know how and when do you really want the maturity, always go for target maturity funds. Now, typically what happens is uh, while, while these funds, you know where the maturity is or you know largely the rate that you are supposed to get, there are two things that you should look outside of these two things while you are doing fixed income investing. Samara. First is, of course, the tax implication. Right now, uh, small saving is going to be taxed very differently then a targeted maturity fund on the mutual fund side is going to get taxed, taxed right? So if you're in the 30% tax bracket, targeted maturity fund on the mutual fund side is a much better option than probably a small saving, right? Assuming that we are talking about an asset which has the same returns that we are trying to compare. And also very importantly, you should look at liquidity, right? So while, while you are very clear that you are going to stay invested for three years, four years, five years, whatever, and which is why you are doing target maturity, Right? But there can, be, there can be a situation that you probably might need to withdraw this money. Now, in most cases, when you do the traditional product investing, uh, it either does not allow you to uh, remove your money 
or it charges you a penalty because you are removing it before maturity. So keep in mind uh, liquidity and tax angle while you are trying to do target maturity fund. But for me, somebody who's in the 30% tax packet would rather uh, take advantage of investing in target maturity funds on the mutual fund side than doing fixed deposits or small savings schemes. All right, Kirtan, thanks very much for your time this afternoon and for explaining, uh, you know, in very, very layman terms exactly how this works. So thanks very much. So, you know, before we wrap up, here are some key takeaways from this chat with Kirtan. The easiest tool to fight inflation is by increasing rates, which is what we are seeing right now, which would thereby cut the excess liquidity. So that is the macro, right? Now, the impact of this in the short term is negative on equity and fixed income and moderate on gold. So for those with existing portfolios, Kirtan recommends to continue following your asset allocation. And for those who are looking to make a fresh investment. So the recommendation for equity is to increase your time horizon. For fixed income, stay on the shorter end of the curve, you know, perhaps opt for target majority funds or like Kirtan said, follow the bubble strategy, which he has also explained. And for gold, well, basically the recommendation is to stick to what you need. With that, we're going to wrap up on this edition of Money, Money, Money. Thanks very much for watching.